five players to keep an eye on for this month. You mentioned the Napoli number nine, Andy, and that's where we're going to start. Victor Osimhen. Yeah, you have to start with him, really, because his move potentially to the Premier League has been set up for a long time. So he signed a new contract um, in January, but it was really to do with providing him with a route out of Napoli. Because you go back to last summer, this time last year, and um, Aurelio Di Laurentiis, the very hard bargaining president of Napoli, said, look, if, if you want to talk to us about Ozymen, put your 200 million on the table and then, then we'll talk about it. Which put off everyone apart from Saudi Pro League clubs. You know, even Europe's riches could not go anywhere there. So he signed this new contract in, in, in January, um, which gave him a release clause of 130 million euros. Um, at that point, it brings all the Premier League clubs back into play. But this is before the PSR epiphany, yeah. which really changes things. And even PSG, uh, uh, who are very close to, to, to getting him or have been very close to getting him, agreed personal terms with him about three, three and a half weeks back. They're th saying, well, we don't really want to go up to that release fee. Now, Napoli have got a problem because obviously they want to please Antonio Conte. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but he likes a little bit of money to, 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 to back him. <laughs> that money is going to come from the sale of Victor Ozyman. Mm. And of course, Napoli are getting twitchy, A, because of that, and B, because when they gave Ozyman all these extra wages, it was like his, his gold watch, really, for his service, for helping them win the league a, a year and a half ago. They weren't expecting to pay it for more than six months. They really need to get rid of him now. Now, Romelu Lukaku is ready as ready can be to join up with Antonio Conte at Napoli, but it can't get done until they get rid of Aussie men. So really, there probably needs to be some sort of compromise between PSG and Napoli at some point, because you know we talked about that superstar that PSG could do with? Well, I think it's, it's probably him, someone who had this absolutely magnetic attraction to all the big from all the big name personalities like Drogba, like Eto at the African Cup of Nations. He could be that next superstar for PSG. Do you know, I think he's, like 12, 18 months ago, I think there'd have been a huge list of teams that were interested in him. And now it feels like he's down to just Chelsea and PSG, who you've just mentioned. I feel like his stock's fallen quite dramatically over the last 12 to, to 18 months compared to, to where it was. Am I right in thinking that or is that I, wrong? I, I, think, I think you are right, but I don't think it's anything you can put on him. I think... The fact is, you, you look at how Chelsea are trying to shift Lukaku, and that's because his contract is a bit anachronistic with what they're, they're trying to do now. That's a, a, a three years ago contract. None of those players are getting paid their signings, even the big money signings of the last couple of years, are getting paid anywhere near what Lukaku has been getting paid. And the problem is, with Ozymen, it's an expensive deal on a personal level. And he deserves that, I think, because of the personality he is, because of the player he is, because he's so incredibly Premier League ready. Now, I do wonder if there's a little bit of Fernando Torres about him, in that the Premier League will bring the best out of him, but it may well break him as well. Because he puts his head in, you might have seen from the mask, in places where other people wouldn't put their feet. Are you going to get 38 Premier League games a season out of him when he's going full pelt? Because he will kind of attract injuries as, as well. And whether he ends up at PSG or he ends up at Chelsea, that is going to be an issue. Do you think that would make him maybe favour a PSG move more? Because, you know, they're going to usually win the league and they concentrate more on the Champions League and maybe roll him out for the Champions League games and the, the big games where they could kind of rest him more. Whereas if Chelsea were to buy him, you'd feel like for the money and the wages, they'd have to play him. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe that's a possibility. I mean, you know, if, if there's one thing about football in France, you will get kicked playing it, as, as, as Neymar found out. You know, people talk about injuries and lifestyle with Neymar. All his injuries are contact injuries because he's just too good and got kicked absolutely loads while, he, while he's in Paris. So I think, you know, he would need a bit of protection, Ozyman, and maybe that's leaving him out of the team for some domestic games, as you say. What about, and you mentioned him briefly there, the Romelu Lukaku leaving Chelsea's side of things. It's a case of, you know, he's on those incredibly huge wages mm. that now doesn't fit in with their wage structure at all. Mm. So, so it's about getting him off the books. Yeah, it is. And, you know, Italy's always where he's done his best work. Um, even though he's carrying an injury for the whole second half of last season, he, he was pretty good. For, for, for Roma last campaign. I think Lewis Dunk still has the scars from that uh, Europa League game where Lukaku really gave him the, the runaround at the Stadio Olimpico. But I think really it's, it's, it's about the, the relationship between Antonio Conte and between Lukaku. You know, Lukaku's played his best football under him. He got him 
in incredibly fit um, with the program that he had for him. He was unstoppable into maybe even the best number nine at the world at that point in time. And that's what inspired Chelsea uh, or persuaded Chelsea to pay all that money for him when we, we, when we go back a couple of years. So look, it's clear that Lukaku is saying no to everything apart from working for Conte. He wants to get the most out of the next couple of years of his career and he believes that Conte is the man to do it for him. Yeah, what about um, Federico Chiesa then? This is a really tough one because I, I know Dan is an absolutely massive fan of, of his and we all are when he's on it. But when is he on it? That's the question. Now, Thiago Motta has already said to him, the new Juventus coach, you're not part of my plans. Juventus know he's got a year left on his contract and just want to get something for him. Now, the latest is that they've dropped the asking price from about 25 million euros to around 15 million euros. OK, you're thinking bargain there. But from the exploratory talks he's had with Premier League clubs, um, Chelsea have been connected with him, but he had talks with the people around Spurs or his people had talks with the people around Spurs last week. And they were quite surprised at the amount of wages he was asking, particularly with how inconsistent he's been in the three years since he was so brilliant at Euro 2020, um, because he's had a cruciate knee ligament injury between that in that time. Um, his development has really slowed. And I think you look at the start of this summer when Roma agreed a feed fee for him, and he said, "Well." I'm on holiday, I can't talk at the moment. <laughs> kind of leaving his options open. So they went, okay, fair enough, we'll go and get someone else. And they went and signed Mathias Soule, who was a, a target for, for Leicester. And, and they've just got on with the rest of their window. And it kind of feels to me that this window, and maybe to an extent the top level of European football, is leaving Chiesa behind a little bit. I feel like Zaniola. Yes. The same kind of thing happened, didn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a danger. I think you've got to be looking at that for sure. Okay, Yusufa Makoko who, uh, again, talking of contracts that are sort of something from a bygone era, Dortmund were really keen to keep him, of course, the youngest player in Bundesliga history, the youngest goal scorer in Bundesliga history, um, at 16 years old, um, now 19, broke all sorts of goal scoring records for, for, for Dortmund, uh, under 15, under 16 level, um, for Germany under 21s as, as, as well, but has really struggled to develop his game over the last couple of years, even with a coach who was really sympathetic to him in Edin Terzic, the former assistant to Slaven Bilic at, at West Ham. Now, his agent came off and uh, came out and kicked off last week, Patrick Williams, about he's not had the chance that, that, that Dortmund promised him in, in terms of minutes. He's not developed enough really to have those minutes. We know he's a terrific finisher. We know Marseille are very interested in him and he's interested in going there. Lille are trying to gazump that deal at the moment. At one point, Premier League clubs would have been all over him. But he earns eight million a year. It's another expensive deal for someone who's still relatively unproven. And staying in Germany then, what about Bayern's Leon Goretzka? Now, you know how Premier League teams, Olivia, have had this problem for years and years. When they want to clear the decks, it's the toughest thing to do. Because mm. those players earn so much money, where do you place them? Now, Bayern have operated in a similar space to Manchester City in recent years. So they've gone out and they've not spent 150 million on players, but the wages are absolutely huge. Their wage bill is quite a lot bigger than when Pep Guardiola was in charge at Bayern, for example. But now you have a, a, a problem when you want to move on from Goretzka, when you're considering moving on from Joshua Kimmich, although they've started contract talks with him for the first time in a while, it looked like he would leave this summer, but maybe he'll stay. And other ones like Matthias de Ligt, for example, is very, very difficult to get the money back that you want and to get all of those wages off the wage bill because you're probably asking in the current climate the players to abdicate some of those wages. Arsenal's right to reject £84 million striker deal, EDU's strategic focus on a winger. Calls for Arsenal to sign a top striker this summer have reached a fever pitch, but these demands may fall on deaf ears, and for good reason. Arsenal has been linked with various players across numerous positions during the transfer window. However, the forward line, in particular, has become the focal point for fans eager to see the club secure a leading striker. Despite this clamour, investment in a striker appears unlikely at this stage. According to Football.London, central midfield is the priority, with interest in Real Sociedad's Mikel Marino. Efforts to sign a striker have not yielded a clear target, suggesting that fans may need to accept the possibility that no new forward will be signed this summer. Eddie Nkidia's situation is also relevant here, as negotiations with Marseille have yet to reach an agreement. 
While Nkidia is open to the move, sporting director Edu Gasper is rightfully holding out for what the club believes is the player's true value. If Nkidia does leave, it might influence the club's decision to add a striker, but it's far from a guarantee. Arsenal already has options like Kai Havertz, Gabriel Jesus, and Leandro Trossard in the forward role, and there is a greater need for a winger. Bukayo Saka is the only natural left-footed right winger in the squad. Fabio Vieira has been forced into the role during preseason, Rice Nelson has been used there, and young Ethan Nwanari has been given a chance, despite their natural positions being elsewhere. Therefore, if Arsenal does pursue a forward, it should be a winger, not a central striker. This is further justified by the lack of obvious candidates for the striker role, with the £84 million required for Victor Gyokeris being a serious gamble after just one standout season for the young Swede. Similarly, Victor Osimhen is another costly option whose performance dipped last season compared to his 31-goal campaign that helped Napoli win the league. Ivan Toni has yet to return from suspension with form convincing enough for any club to make a significant bid this summer. So, what if Arsenal doesn't sign a striker this window? The short answer is, not much. A longer answer highlights the club's record goal-scoring season, which saw them narrowly miss out on the title, even with Havertz playing two-thirds of the season in midfield. He still managed 13 league goals, only one of which was a penalty. His 18 games as a forward last season yielded 15 goal contributions, 8 goals and 7 assists. Signing a striker doesn't automatically ensure Arsenal will win the title or even increase their goal tally. The club doesn't make signings for the sake of it, and if they decide it's better to wait until a future window to assess the market for better options rather than invest in a player they have doubts about, then their track record has earned that trust.